What's up guys, Dr. Shepard here. In a previous video, we talked about DPDR, depersonalization and derealization, and what it means if this becomes a chronic problem for you or develops in the context of another psychiatric disorder or just sort of takes on a life of its own, as we can see in something called depersonalization and derealization disorder. So if you haven't seen that video already, I will link it above, but we are gonna talk about some of the ways that we treat DPDR if it becomes bothersome or starts to impair your functioning. The first thing that I do when I am working with someone who's developed DPDR is reassure them that it is not dangerous. So many people with DPDR start to worry that it might make them go crazy, it might make them lose their minds, it might make them panic, pass out, die, develop some disorder like dementia or schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease. There are a whole host of things that people start to fear when they feel DPDR because it's a really disconcerting feeling, especially when it becomes chronic and you feel like you can't get rid of it. So the first thing I do is reassure people that DPDR, no matter how bad it feels, cannot hurt them, will not cause them to lose their minds or go crazy they will be okay. Yes, it's incredibly unpleasant, but feeling that anxiety and that ickiness and those difficult sensations, that's where it stops. It does not get any worse than that. So when people are in the midst of feeling depersonalized or derealized, I like to remind them that they are already experiencing the worst of it. They're always afraid things are gonna get worse, but I like to reassure them that right now, what they're experiencing, that's it, there's nothing more waiting on the other side. People can also feel a lot of shame about their DPDR symptoms, especially if they develop them after using a substance. For example, marijuana is probably the most common one that I hear that will tip off an episode of DPDR. As we discussed in the previous video, there are a lot of factors that can go into the development of DPDR. There are a lot of people that use marijuana and other substances and don't develop DPDR, and then there are some people who do. So I try to reassure people that although, yes, we want you to stay away from those substances in the future, you didn't know that you were at risk of developing something like this, or of course you would have stayed away. It's not your fault that this happened and feeling guilty or ashamed is not going to help you get better. The second thing I like to do when I'm working with someone who has developed DPDR is that I look very carefully for any co-occurring conditions that may be there. So I try to figure out whether they also have depression or anxiety. Maybe they're abusing substances heavily at the point when they come to see me. All of those things, as we discussed in the last video, can play a big role role in the development of DPDR. And if someone has a bad anxiety disorder, for example, panic disorder, or is in the midst of a severe depression or bipolar disorder, that person may just need treatment of that underlying disorder and the DPDR will go away on its own without any special treatment. And we wanna do our best to treat these co-occurring conditions as quickly and as fully as possible because that's going to improve the likelihood that someone with DPDR is going to recover. If DPDR has kind of taken on a life of its own for the person, the third thing that I will do is really specifically target some of my therapy towards the DPDR symptoms. And one of the therapeutic approaches that I find most helpful for DPDR is mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy. I've talked a lot about acceptance and commitment therapy on some of my other socials and on my blog, but the gist of it is that you are taking on the perspective of a scientist. You are trying to observe the symptoms that you're having in a mindful way, meaning in the present moment without judgment layered on top of them. Once you are able to develop this mindful approach and this mindful way of looking at your symptoms, you're able to start to accept them a little bit more and when you start to allow the derealization and depersonalization to be there that's actually paradoxically what allows them to go away many times people with DPDR get stuck in the derealization and depersonalization because they try so hard to push the feelings away they're really uncomfortable like I described earlier they're really really scary 
And so understandably, people try their best to get rid of them, to ignore them, to push them away, to think through them. And in reality, what that ends up doing is focusing our minds more on the symptoms that we're having. I think of it like one of those little toys, the Chinese finger traps, where you put your fingers in either end of the woven straw tube and you try to pull out. And the harder you pull your fingers out, the tighter the tube gets. If you've ever played with one of these, you know that what you have to do is push your fingers in, relax into it, and that will allow you to pull your hands free. Same thing with the sensation of depersonalization and derealization. It's so important to just allow those sensations to be there, to relax into them, to remind yourself that nothing bad is gonna come of them. I'm gonna let these feelings be here as icky as they might feel. I'm gonna try and be as non-judgmental as I can be. And that's what paradoxically allows them to be. There is also some research showing that cognitive behavioral therapy techniques work pretty well for derealization and depersonalization. And again, the focus of this is gonna be mostly on challenging some of the negative beliefs that underlie the depersonalization and derealization and cause them to continue to stick around. Sometimes we also use grounding techniques I have a video on panic attacks that talks about some of these, and I'm sure we'll talk about more in the future if you guys are interested. But basically, these are techniques that we use to bring ourselves back to the present when we're in an episode of derealization or depersonalization. And that can be a helpful part of treatment too. Finally, if these approaches don't work or if the person's symptoms are really severe, I sometimes consider using a medication to treat the DPDR. And there hasn't been a ton of research on this, which is why it's not necessarily my first step, but the research that has been done suggests that medicines like Lamotrigine or Lamictal may be helpful for some people for treating DPDR. Others like naltrexone, clomipramine, and some of the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, have been used successfully in DPDR as well. But again, and there's not this robust database of research, which makes me hesitant to use it as my first line. That being said, I've seen it be really, really helpful in some people, so it's definitely something I would try if the person was up for it, we talked about some of the risks and benefits, and other treatment strategies maybe weren't as helpful. So I really wanna reassure you guys, this stuff is treatable. It sucks, I've been there. DPDR is not fun and it feels like things are never gonna get better. But if you can find a therapist and psychiatrist who are experienced in treating some of this, then it is absolutely something that can get better with time. As always, this is not medical advice. Everyone is different. So it's super important to talk to your own provider if you have questions or want specific tips or need help. If you wanna learn more about this, leave me a comment below, hit like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see See you guys next time.